The following is a video recording of an unscripted lecture that I delivered to some of my sophomore undergraduate organic chemistry students in which I taught them how we organic chemists go about designing a total synthesis of a molecule once we have chosen a molecule to synthesize. Many of the pictures that I show in this actually come from Paula Yurkanis Bruis's book entitled Organic Chemistry, 6th edition, which I uh, cite in my lecture slides and I'm also citing here for your reference in case you're interested. While I realize that this information is not completely comprehensive and may lack many of the details necessary for rigorous total synthesis, I hope that I've at least delineated some of the general principles that go through a chemist's mind when he or she is trying to design a total synthesis of a molecule. I hope to that end that you will find it illuminating and useful for any of your attempts at designing total syntheses of molecules. So I'm going to talk about and teach you guys today how to design a total synthesis of a molecule. I did that a little bit last week. We'll go into a more depth today. Uh, I've already written these dorky questions, I guess. Once I've picked a molecule, how do I come up with a way of synthesizing it? Uh, I've written that section 6.12 of your textbook can help you with this, but here are sort of my own highlights. So in synthesis, we chemists generally always consider cost. So generally, but not always, cost of a synthesis is lowered by either using very straightforward, well-established, well-understood re chemistri chemical reactions and or using the fewest number of steps possible. There might, and generally you want to have the highest yields possible. So if you have a reaction that has a lower yield but makes some kind of transformation that saves you 15 steps, um, you know that that might be okay. We also, you know, consider the cost of the reagents and everything. So often the easiest way to design a total synthesis of a molecule is to start at the end product and work your way backwards. Yeah, the name of this process is called retrosynthetic analysis. That technique has been used by chemists for a long time. This term itself was coined by uh, a chemist at Harvard named E.J. Corey. He won the Nobel Prize for his work in designing this uh, process. So these are some examples I stole from your book. How could I go from making this uh, or taking one butyne and converting it into this compound, which is pentanone. Once again, we chemists start at the product and work our way backwards. So here's the product. Any of you guys, without looking at the answers, even though they're right there in front of you, want to take a guess at what kinds of reactions I might have to do? How many carbons are in the starting material? Four in, in the product? Yeah, there's one, two, three. Yeah, there's six in the, in the product. So I'm going to have to do some kind of reaction to take my starting material and add on some more carbons. Do we know reactions that do that? Yeah, okay. And to get a ketone here from an alkyne, is there a reaction that we know that can take an alkyne and turn it into a ketone? There is. We talked about it last class period. So retrosynthetically, we start at this product and we say, hey, I've got a ketone. Can I go backwards to an alkyne? I can. And then can I go backwards from this alkyne that has six carbons in it to my starting material that has four carbons in it? And the answer is yes. Once we have our retrosynthetic design written down, we then go in the forward direction and actually write down the specific reagents. So here's the forward direction. If I start with this butyne, I treat it with NaNH2, you remember that strips off the terminal proton and gives you a negative charge on that carbon. I can then alkylate it with an alkyl halide, in this case ethyl bromide, but I can use any length that I want. I need a two carbon length to go up to six carbons, right? Negative charge on this carbon attacks this carbon here, kicks off the bromide, and I get this. Then you might remember if I treat that with H2O, H2SO4, and usually we have to use mercury sulfate. To add a little bit extra kick, you might remember from last semester that that turns an alkyne into a ketone. So there's an example. Here's another example. Can I take this alkyne, ethyne, and turn it into this product, 2-bromopropane? Of course I can because it's written there. What kinds of reactions am I going to have to do? <laughs> Go backwards. 
Yeah, go backwards. Yeah, take our starting material. How, I got a bromine there. What? What? How do I put a bromine on something? HBR. HBR. And what kind of starting material do I have to have? Uh, an alkene. So I've taken alkene and I have an HBR, or I add HBR, I can put a bromine on alkene. Okay. Okay. So I could imagine then I've got this end product. If I went back to this alkene, if I took this alkene and treated it with HBR, the bromine would go to the internal position, giving me the Markovnikov product. So that would work. Now there's a big difference between this alkene and my starting material. My starting material is obviously an alkyne. And, and what's the other difference between this, al this alkene and my starting material that's pretty obvious? Yeah, it's longer. So how do I lengthen an alkyne? Same way we did on the last slide, right? So if I could somehow start with this alkyne here, could I convert it into this alkene? You guys know a way of taking alkyne and turning it into an alkene. How do I do that? Yeah, Lindler's catalyst and hydrogen gas. Now this alkyne here, can I go backwards to my starting material and take the starting material and lengthen it by that amount to get this alkyne? So you can see that sort of what we do. We, we have the starting material in our brains in these kinds of problems in the back of our brain so that we're trying to work towards it, but we go backwards one step at a time. When we're doing total syntheses in real life, we frequently don't have the starting material in our minds. We work backwards until we get to any starting material that I can buy, basically. That seems reasonable. In the forward direction, I take this alkyne, treat it just like we did the previous slide, NaNH2, deprotonates, negative charge treated with this propyl bromide, adds on my three extra carbons, and I've got the right chain length. H2 Lindler's catalyst reduces that to an alkene. Then I hit that with HBR, as you said, Eric, and that puts my bromine on there at the Markovnikov position. Ready for another example? These are boring, I know. I've got an alkyne here, and I want to go to making this OH. Now look at that OH. How could I install an OH there at the terminal end of that, of that uh, carbon thing there? Yeah, the BH3 thing, that's the uh, hydroboration oxidation. In other words, if I take an alkene and I do that BH3 followed by the pero basic peroxide workup, I can uh, get the alcohol in the anti Markovnikov position. So let's look at this. Starting in my product, I'm going to this alkene. So I could do that. Now, starting this alkene, I want, I'm going backwards to my starting material alkyne. Do we know a reaction that will do that? Yeah, Lindler's again. So now we go in the forward direction. I take this alkyne, hit it with Lindler's, or you can use this sodium and liquid ammonia. Do you guys remember that? The difference between these two, Lindler's adds the two H's cis to each other, and sodium liquid ammonia adds them trans to each other. So that gives me this uh, alkene. In this particular case, it doesn't matter if the hydrogens are trans or cis because... This is a terminal alkene. I've got two hydrogens here, so there's not really a trans or cis either way. It doesn't matter which of these conditions I choose. I take this, treat it with my hydrobration oxidation condition, it installs the OH in the anti composition. So this is sort of a review of retrosynthetic analysis a little bit. One of the biggest synthetic challenges that we organic chemists, or I should say new uh, organic chemists face, is gaining the ability to see how to apply reactions that they already know to unfamiliar situations where it's not super obvious. I personally call this ability fluency. So I'm going to show you an example. You guys are all familiar with this reaction, right? Friedel-Crafts acylation. If I gave you this product and I said, I want you, my dear student, to tell me how I could synthesize this thing, I think you guys could all give me the right answer. Start with benzene. Treat it with this acid chloride and, and aluminum trichloride, friedel craft acylation, right? But what if I gave you this product? Now, this is an example you guys have seen in class. This product, um, for some students, might not look as obvious, or it might not be as obvious that this product is indeed the product of a friedel craft acylation, but it is. You can see that if I started with this starting material, which is just, once again, an acid chloride, it's just that the acid chloride is tethered to the benzene ring. This is an intramolecular Friedel-Crafts acylation. So can you see what I'm talking about? Um, it's really easy to sometimes see how to run reactions with things that look exactly the same as what you've studied. But sometimes it's hard to gain the ability or the fluency to see how to apply them in slightly different 
situations. Here's a, an example of Friedel Crafts acylation that I think might be very unobvious. This is an aromatic ring, and I got this from these, uh, this paper that was published here in 2005. This is not a benzene ring. This compound is called uh, <coughs> sorry, parole. It's also an aromatic ring, though. Can you see that? Uh, cyclic, everything uh, has pi electrons in the ring, and if I add the lone pairs, 2, 4, 6, that solves uh, the equation 4n plus 2. It can undergo a Friedel Crafts acylation. So these guys treated this with, th this with conditions that I'm not showing and were able to form a bond between this carbon and this carbonyl, close that ring to form that strange looking compound. Now once again, could you guys, I'm not expecting the answer to this right now, but could you guys look at this product and say, oh yeah, that's a Friedel Crafts acylation. I, I know that I could assemble that. And I don't know the answer to that question, maybe you don't either. But that's sort of the ability that we have to gain as synthetic chemists to be able to go retrosynthetically from complex looking structures to simpler materials. The fluency. How in the world do we gain fluency? The answer is bractus, which takes time. Unfortunately, we don't have all the time necessary to make all of you guys fluent. So what I'm going to do is, uh, or, or to teach you every single little nuance about synthetic chemistry, retrosynthetic analysis. So what I'm going to do is just give you guys a couple of tips. Here are my tips. Tip one is when designing a synthesis, start at the end product and break bonds one bond at a time. So this is a product that I want to make. I'm going to break this bond right here retrosynthetically and you can see that if I broke that bond and were somehow able to start off with these, pro or these starting materials A and B. In other words, if I had a minus charge here at that carbon and a plus charge here at that carbon, you could imagine this minus charge forming a bond here and, and it would give me this product, right? Do you see any issues with compounds A and B? The biggest issue is that they don't exist. So I can't have a, just a CH2 with a plus charge sitting here on a benzene ring by itself and have that exist, except for maybe transitorily in a reaction solution. And having a minus charge on this carbonyl looks really odd. That, those exact reagents don't exist. But are there reagents that I do know of that would behave like these? What can you guys think of that might behave like compound A? Yeah, bromine. So if I want to have a positively charged carbon, if I have that carbon bonded to a halogen like bromine, which is one of our favorites, it acts effectively like that in a reaction. Now, uh, carbanions. What are, what are the popular reagents that you guys know that react as if there were a negative charge on a carbon? Grignards. Yeah, Grignards, right? So Grignards or other like lithium stuck to a carbon or, or copper stuck to carbon. That's like a negative charge on a carbon. Now I can't personally come up with any reagent that I know of that has a magnesium in a Grignard reagent stuck to a carbonyl carbon on a carboxylic acid like that. That looks really weird. And even if it did exist, the negative charge on the carbon would just steal this hydrogen off of another molecule of itself and become protonated. Because this is an acidic hydrogen. But are there any reagents that we know of, like the one that I just deleted, that behave or can later be transformed into a carboxylic acid? <laughs> that one. So sodium cyanide, this is like a, neg a negative charge on this carbon, and I can later convert this cyanide into a carboxylic acid. Do you guys remember how to do that? Yeah, so it's acid and water. Yeah. So now going in the synthetic direction, if I took co compound C and I had a negative charge on this carbon, the negative charge would come in, kick off the bromide, I'd have the cyanide attached here, and then if I took that cyanide and reacted it with water and acid, H2SO4 would be great, it can be HCl as well. It converts this carbon that's triple bonded to nitrogen into a carbon that's double bonded to one oxygen, single bonded to another OH. So that's tip one, break bonds, Write what you make, a negative and a positive, and then see if you can come up with actual reagents that would behave like that. So how do I choose which bonds to break? I taught you guys this last semester. Generally speaking, forming bonds between 
carbon and other atoms that aren't carbon is usually easier than forming carbon-carbon bonds. Carbon-carbon bonds are often very difficult to form. So here's this example. I could think of breaking bond A or bond B. If I broke bond A, I would go up here to this where I've got a negative charge on that carbon and a positive charge on that carbon. Bond B, I could have a negative charge on oxygen and a positive charge on this carbon. Which one looks better to you guys? Yeah, B and, and of course I've written that right there. I'm sorry, but w why does that look better? Yeah, it's a carbon that's bonded to an atom other than carbon, right? So if I ba break bond B, I could come up with an O minus and a CH2 plus. Now once again, neither of these two reagents exist, but can I come up with something that might behave like that? If I want to have a CH2 plus, what behaves like that? Yeah, exactly. A CH2 stuck to a halogen like bromine. Now, an O minus doesn't exist by itself, but I could have an OH here. Can I convert an OH into an O minus? Yeah, just by, by hitting it with base, right? It strips that hydrogen off and gives me an O minus. And then, if this were a CH2 stuck to a bromide or bromine, that minus could come in, form a bond kick off the bromide. Now let's consider this example up here. I've got a CH2 minus and a CH2 plus. The only way I could have that happen is having like a magnesium stuck to this carbon or some kind of other metal that would behave like a carbanion and then a bromine over here. Is that going to be easy to form? You guys know, it, of course not, you guys know that having a bromine, if I had a bromine on this CH2 and I dumped in magnesium, it would put a magnesium here too. So that would be very, very difficult to do. So generally speaking, what I'm trying to tell you guys is breaking carbon-carbon bonds is usually a less effective way to go if you have other options. You, all, you often will get to the point where you have no choice, though. And we've studied many, many reactions that can form carbon-carbon bonds. And that brings us to tip number four. Tip number four is remember your reactions. And believe it or not, you guys have learned quite a few. Do you guys believe that? <laughs> you probably feel like you've learned a zillion of them, right? You guys have learned quite a few reactions. And so it's good to keep the reactions that you know and are familiar with in the back of your minds or the forefront of your minds as you guys are designing retrosyntheses of compounds. Tip five is take advantage of USU's resources. We have a number of different resources that can all be accessed at this HTML. And unfortunately, in this PowerPoint slide, which is posted on Canvas, this is not a clickable hyperlink. So if you want to go to this HTML, you have to copy it and then paste it in your web browser. Sorry. Now, the most important uh, one of these resources that I want you guys to be familiar with today is this resource called SciFinder Scholar. It's so important that I'm going to teach you how to use it right now. Now at this point I went on to teach my students how to use SciFinder Scholar. I'm not including that lecture footage here in this video, but I do have it elsewhere on my YouTube channel, which you can access at this HTML. I hope this has been an enjoyable video. Till next time, have a good day.